satire. Let's talk about satire. This is a definition that you need to know. Sounds really 
on that. So no, it needs to be put together in a sentence. But but these are the elements that are going to be important. I have to know what they're because if you just say critical attitude, humor, it, it could be okay. and it could be or okay. it, you know. So it, it has to make sense. Yeah. But those but that's why I'm, I'm saying this because last semester I did get some answers that were kind of like he's criticizing humanity or he's being funny about humanity. That's not enough. You've got to get the whole thing there. Okay. So, I mean, that also, you know, if you're memorizing and you've only got, I'm, I, by the way, I don't take it personally if, you know, like, if you don't have time to study for the test and then you lead out, you know, I can tell you didn't get back to this definition. I don't take it personally, I'm not going to get my feelings hurt if you don't answer it, but please don't take it personally that if you get zero points, okay? I'm just trying to help you at this point to know how to study, okay? <laughs> I'm just trying to tell you this is how you answer the question to get all the points. If you leave it all out, I'm not going to be mad at you. I'm just saying you wouldn't get points for that one. So, okay, that kind of math, does that make sense? Okay, because in, in, in literature classes, you have lots of writing and you get lots of feedback. And this is for the online folks too. Whenever I say, no, that's really not quite the right answer. I don't think you're dumb. I don't dislike you. I'm just saying, no, that's not the right answer so that then you know what the right answer is. Don't take it personal, okay? Believe me, I know, because I, I wrote for newspapers and stuff for years, and public relations and stuff for years. And they hand the stuff back, and, 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 and you know, you write something, and you never, it's never good the first time. And so if your editor or boss or whatever hands it back, and you start over again, and do that five or six times. And finally, it's what they wanted. But, um, okay, so that's what satire is. It's a literary manner, critical attitude, it's funny, and it's, it's also to improve humanity. Now let's talk about Swift and what's going on at the time of Swift. What did you think about um, a modest proposal? Okay, what did you think about what did you think about a modest proposal? Oh, it was kind of disturbing to find it. Disturbing. I didn't even think about eating a little kid. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's kind of disturbing, and it's yeah, because you're going. This is so bad. You know, you're about to laugh, and then you go. This is. So um, what? What did you think? Um, I don't know, I thought maybe he was just trying to keep the population down. Just, <laughs> like, uh, just some extent, yeah. It looked like he put some kids on the market, on the food market or something. Put some kids on the food market, exactly, yeah. I go to the grocery store be able to pick up a 10 month old kid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 10 months to a year, that's when they're really the best for, you know. Um, I kind of looked at the year that this was written, and it's in 1729. I, kind of, I was thinking, is this from on Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Irish people were not cannibals, even in 1729. <laughs> yeah. And actually, if you look at the way that he writes it, um, okay, if we, yeah, how do we know? I mean, even if we don't know when he's writing it, let's, let's pretend we don't know when it's written. And that's an important question. Would they frown on this then? And how can you tell he's trying to be funny? To a certain degree, but like I said, part of it is just a certain degree. You just sit here and think about kind of kid and season it up. So it's just kind of like, you know, yeah. I went back to board with it. I read it about two or three times. Like, oh. Yeah, it's, it's, it's disturbing. <laughs> it's just disturbing. It, it is. And so in that sense, it's, it's critical. It is critical. Yes. For me to almost like completely understand that he's being sarcastic, I feel like I would have to have a conversation with him. It's kind of hard to get through the through the text of the writing that he's being completely sarcastic and not being serious because he just carries it so far. He does. He does. Um, he says, although there are places where, let's see. The, the part that... I mean, think about, okay, 1729, who would read this? Who do you think would read this? 1729, Ireland. Well, I don't know that many people can read, so. Thank you. Probably not that many people can read. Exactly. It's just going to be an upper class or, like, politicians, that kind of people who can do something about it. 
Yes. People, people who are upper class, probably politicians, or at least people who have maybe the owners of the property, who could do something about it. And so he's not writing this for all the mothers of the little kids who are running around in the streets that he talks about. Okay. Um, why, why would he want them... How do you, do you see something in the tone that makes it sound like that to its written form? Or how do you know how... sense? Does he go and say that, like, to his own... Care to for people that, that own property, you know, stuff like that. So it's more so directed to them. Okay, it's it's directed towards people who own property, and that is that is a problem at this time. Who owns the property? Can you tell from what you've read? Who owns most of the property? Landlords. Landlords. Anything? What what are the landlords like, or any characteristics of them? Where are they? Like wealthy businessmen. Wealthy businessmen, okay. Snooty. Snooty. Unconcerned. Do you know the, do you know the situation in Ireland? Maybe we should give you some historical background. Okay. Um, that might help. <laughs> okay. You have at the beginning of 1600, okay, in 1600 um, to about 1650, you have a lot of... Uh, oops, wrong. 1600 to 1650, you have a lot of changes going on. Um, anybody associate a religious, uh, a Christian denomination with Ireland? Who lives? Yes, they're Protestants, but there's a Catholic Protestant issue. There's a huge Catholic Protestant issue, yes. And it's not just Catholic Protestant, it's also English Irish, okay? It's also English Irish. Because you have, in at the beginning of 1600, most of the property, like, like three-fourths of the property in Ireland in 1600 was owned by Catholics. Most of Ireland was Catholic. You go way back, say, to the 5th century B.C., all the way back to 5th century B.C., okay? Are they Christian in the 5th century B.C.? No, why not? Thank you. It's before Christ. <laughs> they're, so they're not Christian way back then. They're Celts, okay? You had this Celtic, they're Celtic before that time. <clears throat> Early on in the history of Christianity, you have um, Catholics coming, or you have Christians. I mean, at that point, it's pre-Reformation. So you have Christians coming and settling in Ireland. Um, Mm, I guess we could we could go even as early as, as 5 AD. And I don't use the C E silliness because that's the Christian era, which implies I don't know what it or, No, it's what is C B C E before the Christian era or before the yeah. It's in common. Common era, thank you. Before the common era, yeah, that's just silliness. I still do the old fashioned, you know. B C A D. So by, by the fifth century AD, we have Christianity coming to Ireland. Um and then we also have, pretty early on, we have the fall of the Roman Empire, right? We've got the fall of the Roman Empire, the invasion of the Gauls and all these different people, right? Now, what happens though, Ireland's just kind of out there on that island by itself, and it's just, it's really not messed with. So you get monasteries, you get Catholic monasteries that are built in Ireland. No, they're not building cities and towns and becoming a metro metropolis of Ireland. You have this kind of ancient way of living at this point. So it's, they're, they're just kind of, they, they hold up in the monastery, the priests do, and the monks and whatever. And they copy documents. They copy scripture. They copy um, philosophy. They copy these things over for years and years and years. They're really not bothered. So you've got, although you've got the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages in the Roman Empire, way off in Ireland, they're kind of preserving um, education. Uh, there's a book called How the Irish Saved Civilization because in these monasteries, that's all they did was they just studied and copied things over. And that's why you have all these beautiful things like the Book of Kells with the illuminated texts and all of that. Do you all know what I'm talking about in illuminated texts?
show you an illuminated text. I'll have to remember to put this. This one. I'll have to put one on that too. This is what they mean by it. This is the sort of stuff that they were doing. They, they, this is where you get all these the beautiful artwork and the beautiful copies of the Bible. There was one that was coming, making tours through Mobile, and, and different people could uh, participate in copying out the Bible. But it's that sort of thing, this beautiful artwork that you find. And sometimes you find the first letter on a page is just really big, and it's got gold and colors and all this all around it. Um, that sort of thing. Or... Wikipedia. We always love Wikipedia, don't we? Even Wikipedia, although it does have pretty pictures here. So that kind of thing. So they, they, they really decorate the first letter, that sort of thing. That's what they would be doing in, in these monasteries. Um, so you've got um, that sort of thing going on um, in the monasteries. They preserve civilization. So really, our is, is pretty Catholic. Um, you get does anybody remember when Martin Luther nailed the, the 95 theses to the door of the church at Wittenberg? Do I have any history people in here? You celebrate that, a lot of Protestants celebrate this on October 31st because they call it, not, not Halloween, Re Reformation Day, right? It's October 31st, okay? And what you're celebrating is the anniversary of 1517, when Martin Luther, Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg. And at that point, he really wasn't planning on becoming a Protestant or a Lutheran. He was just um, trying to change things in the church. But anyhow, okay, so that's 19, uh, excuse me, 1517, Martin Luther does this. Now, in 1600, Ireland, like, kind of like what's going on with, with Rome, Ireland is just kind of Catholic. It's just hanging out there being Catholic. England, however, is going through all kinds of political upheaval. And so you've got, you've got like Charles, is it Charles II or the I? And he's got a brother, James. Well, Charles is Protestant, James is Catholic, and you get the Cromwell Interregnum in between them. So you get Charles I, who is Protestant, Suddenly, Parliament doesn't like him so much. They're getting battles with the Irish. So between like 16 and 16, 1600 and 1640, you get a battle where Ulster, which is in Northern Ireland, finally there's this long war and you wind up with, with lots of English Protestant forts, basically. They are in the middle of Ulster, which is, they have lots of garrisons, forts. The, the English now have English law up there. There's an English influence. Um, but it's still mostly populated by Catholics, and three-fourths of the people who are there are, uh, that own land are Catholic. But then there is, okay, Charles I is there. Parliament is kind of... Um, undermining him. Parliament wants to really take over Ireland. You don't need to know all these things, but Parliament gets, Parliament and Charles don't get along. The Irish try to back Charles because they think they, that he will protect them from Parliament who wants to take over their land. Um, then you get rid of, Charles gets exiled. The people that supported Charles who were Catholic then get their land taken away and given to Protestant English people, so now you've got the Protestant English landowners, okay? You have landholders who don't stay in Ireland, but they own land in Ireland because they were fighting for Parliament. They were fighting for the British, the English. They're fighting for the English, right? So they were fighting to take over Ireland and colonize it. So you've got, you have the plantation of colonies 
of English colonies in Ireland from around 1640 and on, okay? The problem is there aren't that many English there, and a lot of the people, the Protestant English people who own land in Ireland now don't stay there. Now, if somebody gave you a whole bunch, if you already have a nice castle in England, in London, and somebody gives you, or why don't we say you've got a nice castle in Florida somewhere, yeah. and somebody gives you <laughs> nice weather, um, except during hurricanes, and somebody gives you a lot of land in, anybody from North Dakota? No. Okay. North Dakota. Say. North Dakota? No, you're from you're from right here. Yes. Okay. So somebody gives you a bunch of land in North Dakota. Pretty good farmland. Are you going to go live in North Dakota or are you going to stay in your property in Florida? Stay in Florida. Stay in Florida. Yeah. Okay. You don't want to go to North Dakota. Same thing with the English. The landowners, the landlords stay in England, but they're running property in Ireland with tenants. Okay? What? It's their summer home. It's kind of their summer home, but they don't really go up there because it's too, they're these poor Catholic people who just know how to farm. Why do I want to go up there? And anyhow, the reef leaks. You know, not really all that great. The reef leaks. So I don't want to go up there. So this is what Swift gets mad about. Okay? There are other changes that go on that eventually, by 1700, almost all of the land is owned by the English people. Almost all of the landholders are English and Protestant, but most of the people who live there are Irish and Catholic. This is why they still have uprisings, riots, bombings, and stuff in Ireland. Okay? This started way back when, and it's still, they still fight about it now. So, this is what Swift is talking about. He's talking to those English landlords, to a certain extent, because look at that line. Um, let me see what page it's on for you. Um, I've got my own, my own thing here. Um, yeah, look at page 485. Excellent. Hi Did you highlight this? Uh, somebody, apparently somebody else had um, had the same book. Look, look at 485. Or, I had my class. Okay. Um, look at, I do therefore humbly offer it. Okay, we're looking at that. Would you read that for me? Just read me that paragraph and then, and then down to the children. Okay. I want you to read that for me. I do therefore humbly offer it to public consideration that of the 120,000 children already computed, 20,000 may be reserved for breed, whereof only four, one fourth part to be males, which is more than we allow to sheep, black cattle, or swine. And my reason is that these children are seldom the fruits of marriage, a circumstance not much regarded by our savages. Therefore, one male will be suffi sufficient to serve four females. That the remaining 100,000 may, at a year old, be offered in sale to the persons of quality and fortune through the kingdom, always advising the mother to let them suck plentifully in the last month, so as to render them plump and fat for a good table. A child will make two dishes at an entertainment for friends. And when the fa family dines alone, the four of, the hi of hind quarter will make a reasonable dish, and seasoned with a little pepper or salt, will be very good boiled on the fourth day, especially in winter. I have reckoned upon a medium that a child just born will weigh 12 pounds, and in a solar year, if tolerably nursed, increase to 28 pounds. I grant this food will be somewhat dear, and therefore very proper, proper for landlords, who, as they have already devoured most of the parents, seem to have the best title to the children. Okay. Now, we can tell there that he is being... What, what does that mean? I mean, have the, have the landlords actually come from England up there and, you know, gone gone Irish hunting and had them for dinner? No. No. What does it mean? It's just stating it, you know, that that was his like solution for trying to get a problem. Okay. That's the solution. What, what does he mean, like, though, that the, the landlords have already eaten mm -hmm. up the parents? What are you talking about, like, the land they, they stole from the parents? The land they stole from the parents? Yeah. And then think about it. If you have all you are concerned with about your North Dakota property is that it makes money for you, right? Mm -hmm. So you're thinking about, all I want is to get money off of this. I don't care if those people's roof leaks. I don't care if I'm taking too much from the Think about tenant farmers and sharecroppers in the old south. I mean, 
yeah, you want to keep them, keep people healthy. Your tenant farmers and your sharecroppers, you want to keep them healthy enough that they can do the work, but you don't really care enough to probably, you know, make sure that they are in good living conditions and that they they really have what they need. It's it's not like really profit sharing that much. So we're seeing the same kind of thing going on here, and and so. Okay, we see people some, to some extent today in the position of, I mean, with the economy. Am I going to buy food? Am I going to buy medicine? Or do I buy something to fix the roof, right? The same thing is going on with the poor people in Ireland. And the landlords are absent. They don't come up there to Ireland any more than we would go to North Dakota on a regular basis, right? To check out how things are. They just want the profit. And so that's what he means. The, the, the landlords have eaten up the people because they've taken food off their table by not giving them more income, that sort of thing. It's not humane. Um, the same, the same it, so he's, he's, he's being extreme and he's joking, but he's, it's going to be read, as we said, by the people who own the land, the people who are making the laws. So he's trying to jar them. He says, look, you've eaten these people up. People are dying because you're being too greedy, that kind of thing. Um, and it's not their land. I mean, the people that they're, the, the, the Irish are not even living on the land that was theirs. They're not allowed to own land. They're not, most of the time, they're not allowed to own land, um, except for a, a little bit. Um, another thing that, um, that makes me, I mean, I, it's, it, it, I go between thinking it's funny and thinking, oh, how horrible. Um, so, so how did they, how did, where did they live then? Do they like lease it or something? They, they would lease it a lot of the time. They would be just kind of allowed to live there so that they could, and they would be given a portion, yeah. And, and what you wind up later in the 1800s or in the 1840s, you have the, the potato famine, right? Mm -hmm. Now that's 1840s. He's not writing about the potato famine. The potato famine is 1840s, like around 1845. Um, but it comes out of the same sort of thing. The potato famine happens when you get more of these colonists. Um, England is colonizing America. England's also colonizing Ireland. And you get the colonists who come in, and they say, ooh, we've got our British way, or our English, sorry, we've got our English way of doing farming. So they, they cut down trees. They farm more things like um, corn and all of that. And they allow the workers a little patch of land where the Irish live off of potatoes. They realize that potatoes are more healthy as a one crop subsistence situation. So the Irish are given a little patch of land where they can grow their potatoes and that's what they eat. And then they just farm the heck out of everything else, make, growing, growing corn and wheat and stuff like that. So you have this shift from a kind of pastoral lifestyle, which could sustain them, to now all they have for their own food is potatoes. And there's a potato blight that wipes out the entire crop for several years in a row. And that's why people start coming to America and so many people die and that sort of thing. But yeah, it's like they have just a little patch of ground that's theirs. Um, okay, we will finish talking about Swift on Monday. Thank you. Can you get, can you get your Yeah, I already. Yeah. 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 Y